Lord, you're worthy, hallelujah, of all the praise, hallelujah. As we celebrate our church's 84th anniversary today and our pastor emeritus overseer 46th anniversary, it's going to be done a little different today. All our ministers are going to come and give five minutes exhortation. And the exhortation is taken from 1 Corinthians 12th chapter, verses 7 through 12, and it reads, for the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit withal. For to one is given the Spirit, the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gift of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirit, to another diverse kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of town. But all these work that one of the self-same spirit dividing to every man severally as he will. For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. We all have coming before us the word of wisdom by Prophetess Major, the word of knowledge, Elder Furman. The word of faith, Evangelist Gothi. The gift of healing, Minister Wright. The working of miracles, Prophetess Holmes, myself. Prophecy, Evangelist Jackson. Discerning of spirit, Evangelist Rivers. Diverse kinds, slash interpretation of tongues, Minister Talbert. Hallelujah. Truly, we're on the battlefield, and we thank God for equipping us today with the gifts of the Spirit. Hallelujah. The word of wisdom. Honor's already been said, but we take special honor to our pastor today, our bishop-elect, our overseer. The scripture is coming from 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verses 7 through 11 for me. The word of wisdom, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Verse 8 says, for to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and I will stop right there. The word of wisdom is one of the three revelation gifts. The word of wisdom has no relation to a person's natural knowledge. It's a message from God which brings insight, inspiration, and understanding into a particular situation. It brings peace and removes confusion. The gift of the word of wisdom is given by God and is the application of knowledge. It cannot be gained by studying or by your experience. You can study all that you want, but you will not gain the gift of wisdom. The gift of the word of wisdom is seeing life from God's perspective. The word of wisdom is a supernatural perspective and is used to discover God's will in a given situation. And I'm going to say that again. The word of wisdom is a supernatural perspective used to discover God's will in a given situation. And some of those endowed with this gift through the Bible were Noah, Daniel, Ezekiel, David, Joel, Isaiah, and Solomon. It is a power to use spiritual intuition in problem solving by divine direction. And as I was looking up, the Lord gave me 1 Kings, third chapter, verses 16 through 27. And it reads, now two women, I want you to listen to the story very closely. Now two women who were harlots, prostitutes, came to the king and stood before him. And one woman said, oh, my Lord, this woman and I dwell in the same house. And I gave birth while she was in the house. Then it happened the third day after I had given birth that this woman also gave birth. And we were together. No one was with us in the house except the two of us in the house. And this woman's son died in the night because she lay on him. So she arose in the middle of the night while I slept and took my son from my side while your maid servant slept, and she was sleeping hard, and laid him in her bosom and laid her dead child in my bosom. And when I rose in the morning to nurse my son, there he was dead. 
But when I examined him in the morning, indeed, he was not my son whom I had born. Then the other woman said, no, but the living one is my son and the dead one is your son. And they went back and forth bickering. And in verse 23, the king said, the one says, this is my son who lives and your son is the dead one. And the other says, no, but your son is dead, the dead one, and my son is the living one. Then the king said, bring me a sword. Ah, so they brought him a sword before the king. And the king said, divide the living child to, into two and give half to one and half to the other. Then the woman whose son was living spoke to the king, for she yearned with compassion for her son. And she said, oh, my Lord, give her the living child and by no means, no means kill him. But the other said, let him be neither mine nor yours, but divide him. So the king answered and said, give first the first woman, the living child, and by no means kill him. She is his mother. Hallelujah. As we see that the wisdom of God kicked in, God gave him a word of wisdom, and it was used to administrate justice at this time. Through that gift, he had a sense of divine direction. You are led by the Holy Spirit to act in a certain circumstance and rightly apply knowledge. And another example that the Lord brought to me was when I went to a podiatrist's office. And I know you're saying feet, but that's what he gave me. I had an appointment a few weeks ago. And uh, as he began to cut away an apparent ingrown toenail, the Lord prompted me three times to tell him that I was on a blood thinner. But I kept saying, you know, why am I going to tell this man that he should have read the medical records, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm making excuses. Then the fourth time it came stronger. In my conversation with the doctor, I added that I was on a blood thinner. He stopped abruptly and said, I better stop. I better not go any further. And then the word of wisdom helped me to change what could have been a negative into a blessing because I would have had some uncontrolled bleeding when you are on a blood thinner, you cannot do some things like that. The gift of wisdom is the wisdom of God. Again, is supernatural impartation of facts. You cannot earn it. It works interactively with the other two revelation gifts, knowledge and with discernment. So we thank God for obedience in both examples because God will lead you. And I want to conclude with this, Ephesians 1 and 17. And this is a prayer for a pastor, especially for you, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. We thank God for the gifts that are in operation in the church even on today. Bless the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank God for the word of wisdom. Amen. Amen. Many of the Gentiles who attended the church of Corinth were at one time idol worshipers. The Apostle Paul took note of this and explained to them that because of their past doctrine and belief, they could not profess or acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord without the direct assistance of the Holy Ghost. Paul knew that idol worshipers would get carried away in their ceremonies of worshiping their many and different gods, and that there was the potential of them adding Jesus Christ as one of their deities in their rituals. So Paul took aim at their false doctrine and made it extremely clear that total allegiance to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior could only be achieved through the works of the Holy Spirit. Paul continues to teach this church that there are many spiritual gifts and that each gift is unique within itself. These gifts are distributed by the Holy Spirit to individuals, not so they can become lords over God's heritage or to think of themselves more highly than they ought, but 
that each person work within their gifts as one for the building of the body. He explains that all of the gifts given by the Holy Spirit is to profit the body of the church for the common good. One of the gifts he's given uh, to the church is knowledge. Now this gift is important because it allows someone to explain the mysteries of the Bible and provides that person with the knowledge to expound on those mysteries. Also, knowledge will provide an exact understanding of the design, the nature, and doctrine of Christian belief. Now, all of us at one time, all of us at one time or another, have come to the realization that it doesn't take long to see and to realize that there are many mysteries in the Old and New Testament. These mysteries include prophecies, types, and antitypes, and they require a certain level of knowledge to get a full understanding of what is being said or taking place. So God, in his wisdom, have placed individuals in the body to provide them with the knowledge of the scriptures to share with each of us as the Holy Spirit unfolds the mysteries to them. Finally, if one desires the gift of knowledge, there is a wonderful example in 2 Chronicles, the first chapter, the seventh through the beginning of the 12th verse, which provides the answer of how to obtain knowledge. And it reads, In that night did God appear unto Solomon and said unto him, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said unto God, Thou hast showed great mercy unto David my father and hast made me to reign in his stead. Now, O Lord God, let thy promise unto David my father be established. For thou hast made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. Give me now wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people. For who can judge this thy people that is so great? And God said to Solomon, because this was in thine heart, and thou hast not asked for riches, wealth, or honor, nor the life of thine enemies, neither hast thou asked long life, but hast asked wisdom and knowledge for thyself, that thou mayest judge my people over whom I had made thee king. Wisdom and knowledge is granted unto thee. So if one desires knowledge, let him ask of God, who will give it freely. Praise the Lord, everyone. God is good, and God is great. You know, I praise God, for God has been so good to me. And you know, before I started, I was laying across my bed, studying and reading, but all of a sudden, it looked like the pain wrapped my right leg. I could not read, I could not study, I just could not write. But I thank God for Jesus, and I thank God for the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Because, you know, I, I just said, Lord, you got to help me. You got to help me because I can't make it if you don't help me. So, you know, God is good. But, you know, the Spirit of the Lord just placed these two words in my heart. Just believe. Just believe. And I said, God, I thank you 
because even I, I, I realized that I know that was the Holy Spirit because God had let me speak to one of my um, one of the saints that's in my air in my home right in my area where I live at, and we were talking about the goodness of God. We were talking about the Word of God, and then all of a sudden, that came right back. She was saying that I said, "God, I thank you. Just believe, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe, believe what His Word say. We got to believe. Praise God." Now, my topic this morning was talking about the gift, but faith. And you know, my mind just went on Hebrew, the 11th chapter, and the first verse. And it said, now faith, now faith is the subject of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You don't see it, but you believe it. Believe that the Lord is going to work it out for you. Now, it might be right then and there God might do it. And it may take years, it may take months, and it may take weeks. But you just hold on. Just believe. Praise God. And then prayer, we know, is the key. And faith will come around and not lock that door. But you got to believe. Now, faith is not based upon the senses which yield uncertainty, but rather on the word of God. Now this refer to placing one's faith in the cross and not after the flesh, which refers to depending on other things. But God began with nothing, thereby speaking into existence the things needed to create the universe. We are talking about faith. We have to walk, walk by faith and not by sight. Praise God. And I praise God for that. And you know, my mind went on Abraham. Although I might, the pain might have been wrapping my body, but God kept me going. And I thank you, Jesus. Genesis 22, the first to the 13th verse. Now it said, and it came, just, just keep in mind, the faith of Abraham, his obedience, and the faith that he had in God. Amen. Okay, and the first verse said, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, behold, here am I. Now that's faith, God, God was just talking to Abraham, but Abraham heard and he answered God. And the second verse said, and God said, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac. Now we do know that Ishmael was his son too, but we know that Isaac is the promised son. So he said, take thy son, thine only son that thou lovest. I guess during that time, Abraham didn't realize where was God coming from? What was he going to do? But he said, take thine only son, thine only son that thou lovest. See, God knew that Abraham loved Isaac. But you know, God can test all of us. He can test us in whatever he desired to do, and he tests our faith to see where we stand. And get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee. Can you imagine? Can you imagine Abraham? Take thy son, thy only son. Take him. You know, I want you to just sacrifice him as a burnt offering. Sometimes I, I sit here in my mind, I say, Lord, I wonder how Abraham was thinking. Because it took so long before they could have the son. And God blessed them with that son. But all of a sudden, he said, take thy son. Now listen, he did not call Sarah, did he? But he called to Abraham. Because that plan of God may have changed if he took the lady with him. Because look here, giving up your son? Giving up your son, ladies? No. 
So he called Abraham, not Sarah, but he told Abraham, look here, you get your son and you go where I tell you to go at. You take your son and because I want you to offer him as a burnt offering. And Abraham was what? Obedient to what God said. So as being his obedient, he went. Now I may paraphrase the rest of it. So he was obedient. So that next morning, he got up early and he got his, he got two of his servants that took along with him, got I got uh, Isaac, but he did not get Sarah. And he was on his way doing what God commanded him to do. Now that's obedient, obedient. But still, we could see the faith of Abraham. He believed God. But I believe in his heart, he believed that something was going to happen, that God was going to make a way. So here go faith still going on. So he told him to go to Mount Moriah. When he go there, he was going to tell him what he needed to do. So on his way, can you imagine three days before he get there, can you imagine in the mind of Abraham, now God done blessed me with this son. God has blessed me with the son because he said it was going to bless him. Now what is he going to take this, my only son? Because that's how the enemy play in your mind. If God tell you something to give it to you, God going to let you keep it. But see, the enemy going to say, well, he's going to take my son and he just gave me this son. But praise God, God, God had a plan. God always got a plan for us. If we just continue to stay in the will of God, he got a plan. So on their way up, when they got up there, but the third day, afar off, Abraham saw where he needed to go. So he told the, the two servants that he took with him that you, you all stay right down here while the lad and I go up to worship. Now, all in his mind, if he say worship, he knows something is about to take place. So him and the lad, which is Isaac, they took, he took them right on up. But guess what? The lad said, my father, can you imagine your son and you up there going up to sacrifice this burnt offering unto the Lord? He said, father, I, I, I see you got the, you, 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 look at it, you got the wood, you got the fire, but where, and he must be used to seeing his father when they have burnt offering, when they, you know, go to worship the Lord. And he said, but where is the lamb? I don't see a lamb. But you know, I still see the faith of Abraham. I still see the faith because he told his son, the Lord will provide a lamb for the sacrifice. Now that's faith. Now that's faith. And not only that, you can see that little child, he asked in his daddy, but guess what? His daddy, but when he asked his daddy, he had faith enough in his daddy to believe that it's going to be all right. Sons, well, if you got a good daddy, remember now, he ain't going to tell you no untruth. He's going to tell you the truth. So you got to listen. But as they go up, still thinking about faith, as they go up to sacrifice, Abraham made the altar. And he put the wood. And he got the fire. He got everything in his hand, and he got ready to slay the son, being obedient to whatever God said, but he knew in his heart and in his mind, God is going to make a way somehow. Praise God. But as he did that, the angel of the Lord from heaven, yes. hallelujah, shout out and said, Abraham, Abraham, yes. do thy son no harm. Amen. Praise God. Now, can you see the faith? And you know what? God had a way that was so beautiful because as Abraham, as he looked back, he saw that there was a ram in the bush, that the Lord had a ram. He was all hooked up in God, and that was the substitute for his son, Isaac. I just want to let you know, have faith in God. God will do it. You got to wait on it. Now, I'm not saying God can do it in an instant. Now, if God wants to, he can get rid of this, this, this virus that's in the air. He can get rid of it just like that. But God got a way that's mighty sweet. So we trust him, have faith in him, and believe that the Lord is going to do it. So I leave with you this day, just believe and have faith in God. God bless.
Good morning. We're going to begin with 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. To another faith by the same spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same spirit. Our focus in this message will be on gifts of healing. The gifts of miracles and healings are power gifts. They are in large part dependent on the gift of faith and are often related to the words of knowledge. From Genesis to Revelation, we see the hand of God moving in this area of healing. Now, God never intended for us to experience sickness and to experience death. All that happened because of the fall. As sin and sickness have become twin giants designed by Satan to destroy us, forgiveness and healing are twin blessings designed by God to redeem us and to make us whole. God says in Exodus 15, 26, I am the God that healeth thee. He is Jehovah Rapha. The Greek word for healing is I am a, meaning cure. Out of all the gifts mentioned in 1 Corinthians, healing is the only one that is plural. It is not the gift of healing, but the gifts of healing. The gifts of healing suggest varieties of sickness healed and and the different manners in which the healing took place. Healing comes to us physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. The purpose is to make people well and to set them free from bondage of sickness through the power of God in Christ Jesus. These gifts cannot be turned on and it cannot be turned off at our will. It is the spirit given ability to operate supernaturally in a way that brings edification, exhortation, and comfort to the body of Christ, either individually or as a corporate body. Medicine, whether it is natural or conventional, is not to be mistaken by the gifts of healing. Now, this does not mean that God doesn't use doctors or medicine to heal. Jesus operated in these gifts when he, when he formed which formed the large part of his earthly ministry. He revealed God's will in action, demonstrating that it is in God's heart, nature, and purpose to heal all who are sick and oppressed by the devil. He preached among the poor. He healed the brokenhearted. He caused the mute to hear, the blind to see, the lame to leap, the dead to rise, and the demons to flee. Jesus' atoning death was complete and adequate for redeeming the whole person, spirit, and body. It is Jesus' desire that his followers do the work that he did. In John 14, 12, and 13, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, he shall do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto the Father. And whatsoever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now, there are common hindrances to healing, which include lack of knowledge, unbelief, unforgiveness, unconfessed sins, pride, and when you surround yourself by people, people, unbiblical teaching, negative confession, waiting on physical evidence before you believe you are healed, failure of the elders to pray the prayer of faith, and failure of the church to seek and obtain the gifts of healing as God intended. We should encourage the gifts of healing to function in the church and never allow ourselves to stand in the way of the Holy Spirit. God still heals people. There is nothing preventing God from healing one person through the ministry of another. However, if you don't have a desire to, seek, to see the sick healed, or if you are bothered by seeing people suffering, you may not be used by the Holy Spirit with this gifting. People with this gift, they demonstrate the power of God they bring restoration to the sick and disease. They, have, they bring authentic a message from God through healing. Use it as an opportunity to communicate a biblical truth and to see God glorified. Pray, they touch or speak words that miraculously bring healing to one's body. And they have compassion. Although gifts of healing are not given to every member of the body in a special way, all members may pray for the sick. In James 5, verse 14 through 15, God gives, us definite, God gives us a very definite instruction to the sick. He says, if you are sick, 
If you are sick, your part is to call for the elders of the church. It is their part to, is their part to anoint and to pray for you in faith, and then the whole situation rests with the Lord. Verse 16 tells us to confess your faults one to another, and pray one another, and ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Healing may be achieved by speaking the word of God with boldness and faith. Isaiah 53 and 5, but he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisements of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Healing may also be achieved through obedience to the word of God. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal the land. In still one other instance, God can choose to take his beloved saint to heaven during an illness. Oh, the joy of meeting Jesus, mortal tongues cannot portray. For we know when we behold him, God shall wipe all our tears away. He sh we shall behold the Lamb of God sitting on his throne. There will be no more crying and no more weeping. Trouble will be gone. Hallelujah. There will be joy forevermore when we reach that other shore. Praise God for the gifts of healing. God bless you. The working of miracles. Mark 16, verses 17 and 18 said, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly things, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. The gift of miracles is the manifestation of the Holy Spirit working within an individual. God is entrusting the person with a strength, with an energy, or dunamis power that they normally don't have. It is the power of the Spirit of God surging through the person's hand, feet, or mind, causing one to do or perform something that is not normal or natural to their behavior. A miracle is a supernatural occurrence of event that is beyond our natural comprehension. A miracle is God working through a person or some other instrument to do something that they could not do normally. Miracles are extraordinary events that appears to violate natural laws, but reveal God to the eyes of faith at the same time. God uses miracle to reveal himself, his character, and his purpose to mankind. Miracles may be performed directly by God all through a human being. When we see a miracle, we will see proof of God's divine mission at work. John 14, 12 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believe on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Miracles are often associated with signs and wonders. Miracles always serves a greater purpose. You will know it's a miracle when the supernatural work of God increases your faith and increases your worship in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. All through the Old and New Testament, we see the Lord's hands performing miracles when God parted the Red Sea for the Israelite to cross over. That was a miracle. When God supplied them with manna every morning for breakfast, that was a miracle. Elijah controlled the rain and dew in a challenge with a pagan priest of Baal was a miracle. 
Jesus' birth to his virgin mother Mary was a miracle. The blind received sight, the lame walked, leprosy cured, the deaf hear, the dead raised, and the good news is preached to the poor were all working miracles. Jesus feeding over 5,000 people with two fish and five loaves of a little boy's lunch was a miracle. In the book of Acts, God began his church with a power display of miracles. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell on all the people with a great power, having people from many different nations understanding their own native language. That was a miracle. It took a miracle to convince the apostle and other Jewish believers that Gentiles and other cultures were to be part of the growing Christian church. We have seen miracles in our lifetime, in our own church body. It was a miracle in 1937, 84 years ago, when our four parents with limited education and little of no money built a St. Joseph Baptist Church, which is next door. It was a miracle in 1975, 46 years ago, when some of these same people who are now going home to be with the Lord call a 23-year-old young man by the name of Kenneth C. Doe to pastor this church. That was a miracle. It took a miracle for this, this same pastor with a vision to believe God and build this sanctuary in which we now stand, known as the Bethesda Christian Fellowship. It's a miracle. God meritorious power was present and working then and is still working now. If we can keep our eyes on God and allow the Holy Spirit to do the work in us, we have not begun to see the working powers of miracles of God working in us, through us, with us. He did it then and he can do it now. God won the working power of miracle working every day if we can only just believe. Praise the Lord. The gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy is an area of ministry that is often misunderstood and as a result, often abused. As we seek to understand what the gift of prophecy is, let us first address what it is not. First and foremost, the gift of prophecy is not fortune telling. In other words, you cannot call Miss Cleo and her psychic friends and hope to get a prophetic word from God. What you're going to get <clears throat> is a word from a person under demonic influence whose intent is to get spiritually lazy people hooked on the sensationalism of so-called fortune telling as opposed to maturing in the Lord and seeking God for ourselves. The Holy Bible refers to them as soothsayers. And the prophet Micah said that God will cut off witchcrafts out of thine hand and thou shalt have no more soothsayers. In other words, God equates the practice of fortune telling or attempting to access future knowledge without his permission with witchcraft. So what then is the gift of prophecy? The gift of prophecy is described in this way from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 21, which says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn, and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. When God called forth the prophet, it was often to declare to them that he was aware of their sin and that he would pronounce judgment through the prophet. For example, God called the prophet Samuel to address the sin of King Saul for disobeying him by not destroying all the Amalekites and the livestock that they possessed. As a result, 
Samuel pronounced God rejecting Saul as king over Israel. When David sinned against God with Bathsheba, the prophet Nathan was directed to speak with him concerning David's sin of murdering Uriah. And as a matter of fact, the scripture doesn't say that somebody else murdered Uriah. Scripture specifically states that in God's eyes, David murdered, murdered Uriah. And, and took his wife and took Bathsheba as his wife. He then pronounced God's judgment, the death of the child, and violence never departing from David's house. As a matter of fact, David's three eldest sons, you know, were killed by the sword. When the prophets declared, God has said, they do so knowing that their very lives were hanging in the balance. They understood that they could only speak what God authorized them to speak. Nothing more, nothing less. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 20 states, But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. That being said, we must be mindful that God is just as serious about people applying his name to a prophetic declaration today as he was back then. May God continue to bless his people with the gift of prophecy while also granting us understanding. Amen. Good morning and praise the Lord. Our sermon topic, discerning of spirit, spirits, God's GPS for the church and believers. Our scripture is taken from 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And Revelation chapter three, verse six, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. This gift of discerning of spirits is a revelation gift. God, creator of the universe, God is the chief revealer of secrets and mysteries in heaven and revealing them to men. There are two foundational uh, stones that this gift and the others operate in in the body of Christ in, according to do the will of God, and that's unity and love. According to Matthew chapter 16, Jesus having a conversation with his disciples asked the question, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answers in Matthew 16 through 17, answers and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed thou, Simon Bojona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. The gift of discerning of spirit is the gift of of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit that enables believers to distinguish between truth and lies, even when we are dealing with one another as human beings. We must also remember that the Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity. He was with God from the very beginning. If the gift is given by the Holy Spirit, then it operates in the spirit of mankind to fulfill God's purpose in the church and in the lives of believers. The scripture teaches in John chapter three and verse six, that which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. The discerning of spirit has no relationship with, with that that is natural. There are three areas in which this gift can operate in the divine, meaning the spirit, the demonic, and in the human, which is the natural. 
biblical examples of discerning of gifts that uh, showed up in the Bible is in Acts chapter 8, we find the story of Simon the soothsayer. He looked upon Peter and John with wonder and amazement as they laid their hands upon the people to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. He said in his heart, if I had such power, Simon thought that he could buy God's power and make a lot of money for himself. Peter looked upon him and said in Acts chapter 8, verse 20 and 21, thy money perishes with thee because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part in this matter for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. In Acts chapter five, we find the story of Ananias and Sapphira, a couple who sold a large portion of their property. The couple had the wrong motive and wanted to be popular in the church. As some people today, they feel if I give the church enough money, I would be able to do whatever I want to do. I, you know, I hear the word, but I don't really have to follow the word. They lied to the Holy Ghost, and both of them fell dead at the feet of the apostles. Now, self-examination is equally important for the believer. And what is self-examination? Reflection on one's own character, your motives, actions, in order to judge whether they are truly in accordance with God's values or principles. Every Sunday until COVID, we recite the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 28 instructs us, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Self-examination is very important part of us growing and maturing in the things of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31 tells us, for if we judge ourselves, we shall not be judged. In conclusion, be aware of familiar spirits that's in the church and in the workplace. The first one is the Haman spirit. It plots against the righteous. Accuser of the brethren. Uh, and for those who like going in higher places and the office of higher individuals, cross their legs and you know, that's when that spirit really comes out because you see a person in a place, sitting in the office of someone in authority. You have to be careful when someone always keep asking questions about your coworker, or even in the church when someone is always asking questions about your Christian brothers or sisters because you don't know what they're up to. So as I studied this, the Lord just says to make the congregation aware, be careful. Be careful where you sit, be careful of the things that you say. And this is a new one for me because I, the Holy Ghost gave it to me. Inner circle hand warmers. Who are the inner circle we are? Down here. We are the inner circle to the pastor. And with that, what the, some people do, they stay close to the pastor or leader or even stay close to the church. And the enemy uses them to get for his or her personal gains. Sometimes you can call them yes men and yes women. They say yes to everything. And I experienced that while working um, as a teacher. I said, why is that person always saying yes to whatever that person says? I said, it doesn't mean that it's right. Have you considered or thought about what the person is saying? I mean, as soon as it comes out of their mouth, yes. So we have to be careful with that. Now, a pastor or a leader desire is to have their inner circle team to be loyal, 
accountable, and obedient to the Spirit of God. And there's another spirit that's popular, but you may not recognize it sometime. It's called the Judas spirit. And that Judas spirit is a sellout. Remember, Judas sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. How much are you worth to somebody selling you out? So with that, be careful of certain individuals who ask too many questions about coworkers or your brothers and sisters in Christ. In this season, ask God to place a door over our lips, and sometimes, some of us, we talk too much. Psalms 141, verse 13 says, set a watch, O God, before my mouth, keep a door over my lips. As Christian believers, we have a roadmap to help us stay on the straight and narrow path. Psalms 119, verse 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So if we go astray, we have an instrument, the discerning of spirits, and we have the word of God to keep us on our pathway. God bless. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and it set upon each of them and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. The gospel preacher and the tr true church. The gospel preacher and the true church. The true church, while receiving its inspiration and spiritually divine instructions from the Lord through the gospel preacher, operates and functions by the Holy Ghost. Appointed by God, the gospel preacher, operating under the command of the Lord, is positioned within the body of Christ to be the spiritual Godhead over the church, Amen. which is the functioning representation of the body of Christ on earth. Called, ordained, and anointed in the spirit of God. The gospel preacher, who is the convener over the church, welcomes, acknowledges, and announces the presence of the unseen by human eyes, Holy Spirit, to the awaiting congregation of believers and non-believers. In obedience to the command of Christ Jesus, the gospel preacher, by virtue of grace and hope, anticipates the same momentous Holy Ghost event that took place in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. Amen. The sound of the mighty rushing wind of heaven filling the earth and revolutionizing the tongues of mankind, exalting the Father with praise and worship, with the interpretations that Jesus is Lord of lords and King of kings. 
The gospel preacher maintains the integrity of the word of God as a man whose heart overflows with the good news and as he who has the tongue of a ready writer. A primary responsibility of the gospel preacher is harmonizing the appointed offices, various spiritual gifts, and the natural talents that are in the church to be used by the Lord for the glory of God, to unite the body of believers, to expand the kingdom of God territories, and for the spiritual development and maturity of the body of Christ. Acknowledging every good and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of light. The gospel preacher whom the Lord has appointed as overseer over the body, the beloved people of God, is required by the Lord to maintain decency and order in the use of spiritual gifts and natural talents in the church. Therefore, in the counsel of God, the gospel preacher urges the church to be not ignorant concerning spiritual gifts, especially with the misinterpretation and misrepresentation of the gift of tongues, neither by the misuse of the word of God spoken or interpreted by false teachers. The essence of the gifts of language and interpretations were a sign to the assembly of believers that the promise of God spoken by the prophet was fulfilled. The Lord pours out of his spirit upon all flesh who believes and obeys his words. In his most excellent position, whether he be speaking out of his natural native tongue or in his anointed celestial language, the gospel preacher is identified as the man whom God loves and the world interprets him by his walk as the man of God who loves the Lord. The true gospel preacher is the interpretation of the Son of God who commanded his disciples, disciples to love one another with a pure and fervent heart. Walking in the grace, mercy, and love of God as a willing, obedient body, the 21st century gospel preacher and the church will be the voice from heaven to many nations and ethnic groups across cultural divides and geographical distances throughout the world announcing and declaring in cloven tongues of fire that there is only, only, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. One God and Father of all, and who is above all in you all, the body of Christ. In the body of Christ will be heaven's interpretation. Jesus, the Father's Son, is given to all the world. The Comforter has come. The Holy Ghost from heaven, the Father's promise is given. The church salutes you, gospel preacher, for being a man who stands with God for his people. And as a man who goes before God for all of his needs, amen. God blesses you and favors you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, bless God. And as always, our main purpose and the word's main purpose is for the salvation of souls. Amen. So today, we come in anticipation of those who will accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal savior. If there's one here that desires to return to the Lord, if you are a backslider, you can come. Those that are listening in, whether it be by telephone, YouTube, or Facebook, call in to the prayer line, 848-777-1555. And the conference ID number is 843-838-4410. Someone will be there. One of the ministers will be there to answer their call and to lead you to Christ. But even now, all it takes is a sincere heart calling unto the Lord, and he will meet that need. So let us bow our heads as we pray and ask God to minister unto us as we receive the word that has gone forth. And for those that desire to receive the Lord today or any backslider that has walked away, God loves you. And he's waiting for you to come back with his arms wide open. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you, Father, for your word that has gone forth today. For, Father, we realize that your word will not return unto you void, but that it will, God, bring forth that which was accomplished for. And, Father, your word has gone forth, and we realize that your word is your son, Jesus Christ, who died that the world might be saved. Now, God, we pray that the Holy Spirit will draw, will draw those that have walked away from you, will draw those that have, do not know you in the pardon of their sins. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that you will save today, deliver and set free. Father, for that individual that know you not, as they bow their heads and repeat unto after me, Lord, save me. We pray, God, that you will touch their hearts. The backslider that have walked away, God, touch their hearts, God, and let them return unto you knowing that you love them and that you're married to them in the name of Jesus. And even, God, the saints of God, we come realizing, God, that we have sinned and we've fallen short. For we realize that all have sinned and we come to you, God, asking forgiveness today. And now, God, we pray that your will be done and that you'll continue to minister unto each and every one of us and to everyone that calls upon your name. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen and bless God. We praise God for what he's done in this place. We thank God for the spiritual gifts that are in operation. Come on, let's give God a hand clap of praise because of who he is. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And everyone here that's standing, we want you to stand as we salute our pastor. We thank God for this man of God. Forty-six years of toiling Ephesians 4.11, we read it earlier. He gave some, Pastor, come forth. Come forth, Pastor. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. You stand, Father. We thank you for standing in your calling. We thank you for the perfecting of the saints through the word of the living God that you preached. Amen. We admonish you, Pastor, that you continue in the faith, yes, that you allow the Lord to reward you for your faithfulness and for your obedience. Yes. 
we admonish you to allow the Lord to exalt you, to take you places where you've never gone, places you've never even thought of. Amen. We thank God for you. We lift you up, man of God, as our pastor. Ah, uh, we thank you for being our pastor all of these years. Thank you for being the overseer. Thank you, Bishop Elect, to walk in your calling. The Lord has great things for you. We're looking forward to what God is going to do for you. Because through you, he will bless each and every one here Amen. in our respective places. As you go forth, as the Lord exalts you, we in this place will too be exalted. You go to the different areas, we will go with you. And we thank you for the spiritual gifts that have been spoken about in this place because they are present and we thank God for that. We give you your flowers while you yet live. We thank God for the people of God in Bethesda who wanted to bless you. And in that beautifully decorated box done by Sister Cynthia Holmes, we bless you. On that box, there's a crown and we call it a crown of righteousness. We thank God for you walking again in that calling. Thank God for the people of God. Why don't you let's get God a hand for the man of God. We bless you, Pastor. We exalt you. Peace to you. Your labor is not in vain. We thank you for all that you've done for us. Uh, we thank you for just learning who you are and whose you are and how you have taught us all these many years and we have gleaned from you. We will not forget. We will not forget you as you go forward and as you are overseeing what's happening here at Bethesda. We shall do what we have learned and shall do it decently and in order. God bless you, man of God. Jesus, I'll never forget Amen. what you've done for me. Amen. Jesus, I'll never forget how you set me free. Jesus, I'll never forget how you brought me out. Jesus, I'll never forget. No, never. How can I forget what you've done for me? How can I forget how you set me free? How can I forget how you brought me out? Jesus, I'll never forget. No, never. I bless God for today and for all of you. I thank God. I honor the Lord today. Thank God for the Spirit of Christ, for the preachers, for my family, for the church family, friends. I thank everybody. And uh, I know we, we are in the midst of a, a different season. All I can say is don't despair. Don't despair. Um, I am not worried. Um, this is the Lord's doing. And it is good. And uh, the end of the matter is going to be far better than where we might be right now. So let's continue to pray. Be encouraged. We are not in any kind of trouble. And we ain't taking no applications. Uh, uh, the Lord is just turning things. He's turning me. He's turning me and uh, causing me to see what I need to see, even if it's what I didn't want to see. Um, but it's all for his glory and for our good. I love y'all. I appreciate y'all. Let's keep on working together. 
there's a great camp meeting in the promised land. God bless you. Amen. Woo. Hallelujah. Oh. Thank you, Jesus. Ooh, glory. Hallelujah. Thank God for the gifts that's working in this place. Thank God. Hallelujah for our pastor. Thank God for Bishop elect. Thank God. Hallelujah for where he's brought us from. Thank God for where he's going to take us. Hallelujah. We thank God for all that has happened here on today. Thank God for the display outside. We thank God for, our, I'm sure it was the smallest, uh, but we thank God for us giving unto our pastor. We bless God as we leave this place. We go in Jesus' joy, knowing, hallelujah, that it's God who worketh in us to do all that we do. Father God, as we come in the name of Jesus, I, ooh, I thank you for the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, have your way. We thank you. We thank you for the man of God in this place. Bless God like never before, God. God, we thank you for exalting him. I pick him up, God. We thank you, God. Hallelujah for where you're going to take him, God. We thank you for your people here in this place. We ask that you're blessed right now with the blessing that they're in need of. Go forth and do according to your will, God. We thank you and we praise you for what you are doing, God. We bless you now in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Thank you.